for those that care and for those that it matters to. This is what we would call in the sports world an important football weekend. This is the final week of the regular season, week 18. It's the final games will be played to determine playoff spots from all different parts of the country. Sorry, New York Jets and New York Giant fans, 4-12 and 12 doesn't get you there. But then tomorrow, they're looking for the nation will be riveted. For those that love college football, they'll be riveted to Indianapolis as two college teams will play for the national championship. But the part that I was very interested in was this. Years ago, there was a time when college football had difficulty moving out of their comfort zone. It was 1905, and if you were to watch a game like tomorrow night in Indianapolis with college football, the games were played on that gridiron, but characterized by simply running, kicking, and a lot of dust, and usually three yards at a time would be gained. In fact, the whole team, the whole game was played on the ground with leather helmets. And in fact, in 1905, 18 college players died while playing the game football. Here's what's interesting. Then in 1906, something happened. They legalized something that has never been legalized before in football, and it was called the forward pass making it possible to gain a lot of yards by simply a flick of the wrist. However, most teams stayed in their comfort zone and still ran the ball. Now, what they kept doing was what they had already done, even though, get this now, they had the capability of going further, faster. I have a friend that will probably be here at the one o'clock service his dad has become a friend of mine who has not only played for the NCAA championship teams of basketball but he has coached them and the last team that my friend Jim Cruz coached was SLU St. Louis University which changed the game the last college he coached moved out of their comfort zone in 1906 when the pass was legalized and it was the first university in America to throw a forward pass. The very first one. And it was incomplete. But here's what's amazing. Their, their mishap didn't stop them. But what happened to them was SLU switched to throwing a forward pass the entire season. It was an aerial assault. And that year they went 11-0 and outscored their opponents 402 to 11 because they adopted something when the times changed. Times Square Church, while everyone is running, I have to tell you something, we're about to go to the air and throw a forward pass. That's what we're getting ready to do. It's time to go further and faster and time to come out of a comfort zone. And in fact, before I pray right now, this has to be, I believe, for those that are here and those that are watching online and those that will eventually hear, it's probably, and it is, the most important message I've preached in four decades of preaching the gospel. Because I feel like God has given me something, and this is what I want to talk to you about. God has given me something to do until I die. This is it. I, am, I know what God has asked me to do. Let's pray. Father, I pray that right now in these next few moments... Right here at Times Square Church on 51st and Broadway. I know that since I started to talk to the Times Square Church board and to our leadership team about this, that God, as I opened up my mouth, it seems just on the few conversations, hell has opened up its bowels against us. That, Father, I know that there's something here that you are going after. There's something here that I believe that sometimes, oh God, I believe not just sometimes, I believe it is a standard that Satan attacks whatever God is putting his signature on. I believe that satanic attacks are sometimes the best confirmation you're moving in the right direction. So Father, today in these next few moments, for us as a church, for churches that are watching, for pastors and leaders that are watching... I pray, Lord God, that you would give us king, make us kingdom-minded for what you're about to do and what you're about to say. Let us take it to the air 
when God, when we have the ability to do something that we have never done before. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. I want you to get ready. I really want you to buckle up for what I believe God has spoken to me. There was a church in the north that was exploding in growth that caught my attention. It wasn't in the United States. It was north of Jerusalem, and it wasn't this year. It was about 2,000 years ago. It was a church called Antioch. This Antioch church caught my attention 300 miles from Jerusalem. The Jerusalem church was wondering what is happening in this Antioch church. It seemed that God was going to the air, that something was about to happen. It didn't not look like the original church in Jerusalem. Some new things, something was taking place in this Antioch church that I want you to notice. Because they didn't ask the people like the Jerusalem church to be circumcised. In fact, people were coming to the church that never would have stepped into the Jerusalem church. So in order to make sure this wasn't getting weird, the disciples, the apostles in Jerusalem decided to send spies there, or really one spy. His name was Barnabas. And they said, we're going to send Barnabas there to see what's going on. Here's the part I want you to see before I read the passage to you. Keep this in mind. The tough times created the new venues for the gospel. Difficult times created new venues and new opportunities for the gospel. That if everything would have stayed in Jerusalem, you, they would have stalled on the Great Commission. Listen to what the Bible says in Acts chapter 11. So in those who were scattered because, here comes the tough times, of the persecution. That's what started in Acts chapter 8 after Stephen. In the connection with Stephen, made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Speaking the word, here's, here's ground game. Keep the ground game in mind. Speaking the word to no one except the Jews. That's running the ball. But something happened. This is their 1906 moment. That this is the SLU that's about to go to the air. Keep this in mind. But there were some of them. There's always some people that will mess up everybody's lives. There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Jews only. Nope. To the Greeks also and preaching Jesus. And the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord was with them and large numbers started to believe and turn to the Lord. And the news about them reached the ears of Jerusalem. So they sent the spy Barnabas to check out what was going on in Antioch. The persecution created something that would, that would not have come to existence, listen now Times Square Church, unless difficult times came. It, this, this Antioch church never would have started if the difficulty didn't take place. That means, you ready for this? Look for new things in bad times. Look to see what God may be, the forward pass that God's going, I'm sending you to, into this to go maybe further and faster. And verse 20 is interesting. It says, there are some Cyprus men, basically, who made a forward pass. That's what, it, that's what these, these guys did. They began to take the forward pass. The old school guys were saying, speak to the Jews only. But these new guys were going, let's speak to the Greeks. So what happened in Antioch? You ready for this time square? What happened is verse 21. A large number turned to the Lord. Souls saved. Listen now. Souls being saved is a litmus test of the approval of God, not our comfortability. It's when God starts saving souls, all of a sudden Barnabas comes in to investigate. It's always funny to me. Do you remember what Barnabas was? The end of Acts chapter 4, Barnabas was from Cyprus. And I was wondering if the early church goes, Barnabas, you go. You're from Cyprus. You go look at those crazy guys. They're from your same country. Go talk, go talk to them and see what's taking place here. Let me give you the Barnabas report here for just the next few moments. Here's the Barnabas report. Verse 23. Then he arrived, witnessed the grace of God, 
And he rejoiced and began to encourage them all. Go Barnabas. I love that. He arrives, saw the grace of God, rejoiced, and began to encourage. Can I give it to you out of the message? I love the way it said it. Listen to this. As soon as he arrived, he saw that was God was behind and in it all. He threw himself in with them, got behind them, and urging them, stay with this the rest of your lives. How awesome is that? When you start to look at this, he rejoiced what God was doing, even though it didn't look what, like the church that he even came from. The church of Antioch was suspect because it wasn't what they were used to. But you ready for this now? There's one other element I want you to get. It wasn't just new converts in the church, but it was the emerging of new and future leaders in that church. New people God was putting his finger on in this place. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? So remember, remember the Barnard's report? He says, stick with it. Remember the, what we just read? He threw himself into it. Remember that? Listen, he, he, he did it. Listen to what it says here. Verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for who? Saul. And when he found him, a hundred miles away, he went and got the new guy. A hundred miles away and brought Saul, who is the Apostle Paul, back to Antioch. What happens? So for a whole year, I love this part, Barnabas and Saul, new and old, start working together, met with the church, taught the great numbers of people. This is the discipleship part. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. How amazing is this? Folks, think about this. Antioch was Paul's first missionary assignment. It it was his first ministry assignment was Antioch. That God was going for what I'm doing. I may not use the same cast. I may bring some different cast from different parts to do this. Now, folks, stay with me for a second. Because this church is so important for us to understand how God began to do something. The church, the way we know it, is about to change, Times Square Church. It is changing. It's, it's not. I, I, the church that some of you saw when, when Nikki Cruz and we saw the B-roll of Nikki Cruz up there and we saw the choir and the stage and we're looking at this going like, oh, I remember that. That is Jerusalem. But we're entering into an Antioch season where God is beginning to go, I need it to go further and faster. I need to get to where I'm going. For what reason, Pastor Tim, I want you to understand what is changing in the church today. The vaccine mandates, COVID-19 variants, intermittent shutdowns like we've had to do the last two days. There are some of the largest churches in New York City are shut down today. I've talked to one of the pastors. He says Omicron has just run through his staff, and so he has to put a pause on services. But listen to me carefully, Times Square Church. The pandemic is not the persecution of the church. I want you to be very careful of thinking that me wearing a mask, they're persecuting me. I want you to stay with me. The powers that be are just dipping their feet in the water and we haven't gotten there yet. Because the persecution that will come will not be from a variant, will not be from a a, a virus. The persecution that is coming to this country and the church are coming against the church because of churches that preach the truth of the word of God uncompromisingly. That is where the persecution is going to come from. It is going to come from preaching truth. I believe that we are just a few years away. I don't know when exactly, but there is, a, I believe, a persecution progression that you can keep your eyes on. I believe, and it's already happening, that there will become a censorship on social media for those who preach the whole gospel. That those that are watching right now on Facebook or those that are reading things on on Instagram and and knowing that whether we're opening or Nikki Cruz is coming or what the in-person or the week of prayer and fasting, those things that you see on Facebook, those things you see on on Instagram, those things you see on Twitter, I'm telling you folks, 
if we preach this book and we don't compromise the truths that God has given to us, the truth, the truth, not people's truth, the truth of the gospel, they are going to censor and pull the churches that preach us right off of those. And it's already happening. Then, then, there's going to be the removal of tax-exempt, tax-exempt status. The 501c3 will be removed because you can't be part of a government that says if you don't fall in line, we can't give you benefits. And they're going to, they're going to remove that. I'm, I'm telling you, folks, and then for those that keep preaching this Bible, those that keep preaching what the truth of this word says, I believe then they're going to find the church. I believe there'll come monetary fines to find the church and say, if you continue on, we are going to find you. And then I think the fourth thing, I think they're going to chain the doors of the church, but that is not going to stop the kingdom of God. I'm telling you right now, folks. I know this is coming. I know our doors will be chained someday, but I am telling you that everything that we have been doing for these last 20 months is getting ready to throw a forward pass and to take this to the air and say, it's not gonna, this next season is not going to be run on the ground. It's going to be run through the air. And God is getting us ready for this season. Because when that takes place, now this is the vision that I want to share with you. Because when I thought about the intensity and the fierce opposition of the government, what's amazing is my heart began to go, God, then what's next? What are you asking us to do as a church? And this is where my heart got excited. This is what started to stir inside of me. Because I believe that the first church shutdown from the pandemic was a dress rehearsal to get us ready for what is coming. So keep this in mind, church. Get this now. The first century church that you just read about, that whole phrase, the persecution, the first century church faced the fiercest government oppression and persecution in all of church history. If you didn't salute the flag, if you didn't obey the government, they would confiscate your, your property, they could shut down your businesses, they could send you and, and, and send you to your death. They could put you in jail and even put the death penalty behind. Thus, where the gladiator games started to come in, the pre-gladiator, it wasn't the gladiator games itself, but that's where they used to persecute the Christians before the gladiator games would even take place. And I'm telling you, but here is what encouraged me when I started to think of what, was, what came upon this church, but what God also did. When the persecution came in Acts chapter 2 and it started, folks, This is what got me excited. Something else came. And I want to give it to you. Here's what it says. It says, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Get this now. Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Folks, here's what got me excited. You ready for this? As the fury of the government rose, so did the favor of all the people around them start to rise. Do you understand what this means? That as the government came against the church, it was the people realizing we need the church. We need the truth of God. Folks, this is what got me. It says having favor with who? All the people. As opposition rises, the favor of the population and the openness to daily salvations begins to cover over Jerusalem. That government opposition against the church, I believe, is the signal for a revival that's supposed to take place and that God is supposed to do. This is where it starts. I want to say this and I want you to hear it. I believe it with my heart. As the government begins to say, you can't pray, I'm telling you the masses are going to say, please pray for us. As the government says, you can't teach this book in public, I'm telling you the masses are going to say, tell us what this book has to say. As the government says, we'll define We'll let people define what their gender is. I'm telling
telling you, the masses are going to say, get us out of this bondage and tell us what the truth is. It doesn't matter what they vote in a court. It doesn't matter what Albany or the city of New York says. I believe God is about to do something that our job is to say, God, we want to be ready, not with the government. That's why, folks, my hope is not in a Republican or a Democratic candidate. My hope is in God. That's what he's in. We are not going. The church, the true church, is not going to have favor in D.C. taking photo ops with the president and with City Hall. Our favor is not with government officials. Our favor is with the masses that are going, teach it to us. Tell us what it says. That's what the church did. And so if all of we are trying to do is to try to fight all these, these different type of battles, that's why then the church doesn't do what it's supposed to do. I had a pastor tell me this. They said a lighthouse is just an attraction until the darkness comes. It's just an attraction. When the darkness comes, we better have a light to show. We better have a light to show at this point. And here's how. The Bible says... And the Lord was adding to their number, here it comes, day by day, those who were being saved. Folks, look at that phrase again. Some Bibles say daily. Some versions say day by day. Did you understand it doesn't say weekly, it says daily. Not just on Sundays, but every day. He's saying get ready For the church to explode and spill outside of the doors on Sunday that people don't have to wait till Sunday to become born again. They're going to get saved in Starbucks. They're going to get saved in sporting goods stores. They're going to get saved in restaurants. They're going to be waiters and waitresses that, folks, I'm telling you, God is changing the venue. I, I received a note that I carry in my Bible. I got so many precious and encouraging Christmas cards from all of you, this, this Chris, Cindy and I were so thankful. But there was it on a scrap of paper that I carry with me in this Bible. And it was from a Jewish ministry from Israel. And it literally, it's, it's just three lines. That's all it says. Thank you for the ABCs every service. Don't ever stop. I said, that's all I need. I said, listen, I thank everybody for all your encouragement. But that's the one that meant the world to me. Because you know what's happening? Listen carefully, TSC. Do you know why we do Born Again Ask every single week, every Sunday? There's two reasons. One, so you know whether you bring your friends or whether you share the message, the last seven minutes people are going to have the opportunity to choose eternity. I I promised you that. I can preach on marriage. I'll find a way to get to salvation. I can preach on the second coming. That's easy. I can, preach on, I can preach on tithing and end up at born again. But let me tell you, that's just, I've made a commitment to you. But let me tell you the second reason. Why the repetition? Why is it over and over again? Listen carefully. Listen online. Do you know what it is? You're being trained to do it where you're going. This is for you to go. That you're going to go, you're going to look at somebody and you're going to go, hey, just as you had a first birth, you need a second birth. The first time, that, that's where you're born in a hospital. Second time, that's where Jesus needs to come. In fact, let me tell you, it's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit. B, believe. And C, confess. And folks, why do you think we do this every week? It's not for Sunday. It's for every day in venues that we can't get to. That's what we're doing. We're getting ready for what God is wanting to do through you. You know what we're doing, folks? Let me give it to you this way. We're getting our nets ready. That's what it is. Jesus said this in Matthew 4, 19. He said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's that's what he did. It it was interesting. He tells these fishermen, not fishers of fish, but fishers of men. And it's interesting to me that there were two types of fishermen in that time of the first century. There was hook and net. Hook 
was for a specific type of fish. You'd put a, a certain bait. Now, uh, let me just say this. If you're going to judge me for my fishing capability, I, I, I'll bring Pastor Patrick up here in a second. But let me just tell you, let me just give you as much as I know. Hook was for a specific fish. You put a certain thing on a hook, you baited it a certain way, and it was for one kind of fish. The net was different. This is what Jesus was talking about. He said it's a net that when you threw it, the net was for anything that was in the area. It was for anything that, that when you threw that in and hauled that fish in and haul, and haul that net in, it was to bring in anything that was in the region of that. That's why TSC, we are net people. We've got so many different countries, nationalities, different lifestyles, from the rich to the poor all around us. We're throwing out a net. See, the progression of the nets in the New Testament was very interesting. Jot this down very because it was very interesting to see. The progression of nets in the New Testament was this. The first time you began to see them, they were mending nets. That was Matthew 4.20. It was them checking for holes and repairing rips so they didn't lose any of the fish. It was looking at the infrastructure. It was looking at the way they were doing, in, in a sense, kingdom of God way. They were looking for anything that would begin to lose fish. It was looking at something to say, we've got to make sure that we throw this out, that there is no holes, that we're not losing anything. So it really is a checking, a mending, is looking at holes and repairing them. The second thing was they, would, oh, they were found in Luke 5, 2, washing their nets. See, it was the constant removal of debris and junk and dirt. You know why? Because those nets needed to glide on the water. Because if it didn't glide, it meant that it would scare away the fish. It had to glide. There needed to be an ease to it as it would begin to glide. So they would begin to wash the nets to make sure that there wasn't things hanging on that would begin to cause problems for the bringing of the, of the fish in. John 21, 6 calls it the casting of the nets, the third level, casting. That's the ABCs every week. That's the ABCs that we did and saw the, those four days here just before Christmas that we saw 443 people come to Christ. It's a casting of a net and bringing them in. It's ABCs every week, it's then, and, and God eventually moving it to every single day. And then finally, it's the drawing of the net. That's Matthew 13, 48. That's when you're keeping the fish. That's, we're, that's something that we're working on this year to go, okay, we've got, we've got content, but we've got to work on the discipleship part because we can bring them in, but we also have to disciple them. We don't want to just birth babies, but we want to grow believers, and that's why we want to multiply those things. Someone asked me to listen to a podcast a few weeks ago that, that it wasn't the podcast content that inspired me, but there were numbers there that began to put a, put a fire deep down inside of me. God spoke to me as I was listening to this. God spoke to me and said, this is what I want you to do until you die. This is, the, the, this is your finish line that I want you to finish your race with. Now, folks, this is where it gets crazy. So I, I literally, I, I, I have been avoiding this for months because I didn't want to say these words because ever since I said it, it seems to get more and more difficult. But, it, but at this point, I'm, I'm all in. So whatever happens, let it happen at this point. Here's what I've learned. This is the numbers that there are 600 million Buddhists on the planet, 600 million. There are 800 million Hindus on the planet. Right now, there are 15 million Jews around the world, and the number, 1.5 billion Muslims that are on the planet. Now, this is gonna be a little liberal, but they, according to this brand new statistic, 2.3 billion Christians right now. 2.3. Now, some of you are going like, that, that seems a little generous, and it probably is, but let's just use that number. 2.3 billion Christians on the planet from all seven continents. Amen. <laughs> At least somebody is happy about that today. 2.3 billion Christians of a 7.9 billion global population means that there are 29% of this planet are Christians. That's a good time to say hallelujah. So I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful. But I felt the Lord speak to me. Before, I'm going to teach you a prayer here in a second. 
This is what I knew. Whenever God speaks to me, I had a friend, a pastor, a youth pastor in Alabama teach me a prayer that every time I feel my heart is moved, I feel like I have to remember this prayer. And this was the prayer he taught me. God, the answer is yes, even before you ask. Folks, that's a good prayer to scribble down or take a screenshot of. Let me, let me read it to you again. God, the answer is yes, even before you ask. I'm not interested in, the, I'm not interested in, the, in, in all of the, 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 the complexities of it, but God, the answer is yes. And that's what I whispered to God. When he spoke to me, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, move the needle on the 29% Move the needle before you die. Move the 29% as a church, as a ministry. Move the needle before you die. So this is what I'm saying. The answer is yes, even before you ask. So when I heard the Holy Spirit, after reading all those numbers, move the needle. It was the next thing that I heard that I was going like, at first, the first time when I heard move the needle, I was going, yes. That's easy. And then he said, can you believe for a billion souls? Can you believe for a billion souls? Think about this for a second. An additional billion souls moves the needle to 42% of the planet. That I just go, God, why not? You're God, I'm not. You've got it all from here. So God, I've got to believe that, Lord, if it's about souls that, Lord, we've got to take it to the air because we can't run a ground game on this. We've got to take this to the air. How? I'm telling you, folks, how does this happen? How do you even think this way? It's God taking it to the air because weekly, weekly salvations, that's just addition to the church. God goes, I don't want addition. I want multiplication. That begins to take place, I believe, through connect groups on the air, through, through the internet. I'm believing, I want you to listen online, I'm believing for connect groups in all 197 countries around the world. I'm believing for connect groups in 50 states around the world. And that's just the beginning. That still doesn't even, even begin to scratch the surface. But that's why I'm telling you, if you're here today, that's why as we get ready to go into February, we want you to lead a connect group. We want you to lead a connect group from a country you're watching from, whether you're watching from Nigeria or South Africa, whether you're watching from the, even, even from, from Brazil or Colombia, wherever you're watching from, we want to believe that God is going to begin to move the needle. I'm believing Summit with Dr. Teresa plays an important part for training and for sending. And maybe God's going to speak to you that you need to give, us, to give some years to being trained for the harvest in Matthew 9, 38. And maybe it is to go to our Bible school at the, at the semester. But I believe going to the air is this church. I believe the net is the internet. And we are to be casting the internet like Pastor Carter has, has taught us. You ready for this? I want to give you the verse that God began to speak to my heart. Folks, I'm just going to read it the way it says it. You ready for this? This is what it says. This is Micah. Get this down. You can't make this up. And it will come about in the last days. How many believe we're in the last days? That the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established. This is the favor of the people. As the chief of the mountains. It will be raised. And the people will what? And the people will what? I don't know if Micah meant internet. But I sure read it that way. I still, so when you talk about going on the internet, I feel like God, I'm going, God, it says, and the people will stream to it. So God, whether that's on Facebook, whether that's on YouTube, whether that's on some new Christian, whatever that is, I got to believe. And who's going to start doing it? You ready for this? It says many nations will come and they, they will come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the Lord. That's what it says. And the people will stream to it. And this is the kind of people that are coming. You ready? In that day, verse 6, 
He says, I will assemble the lame. I'll take the outcast, those who have been afflicted. I'll make the lame a remnant, the outcast, the strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever, God says. He says, everyone that nobody wants, he says, we'll take those in. They'll figure out a way to stream to that mountain, but they're going to get there. We're not going on the ground. We're taking this to the air. That's what God is asking us to do. I believe that with all my heart. That the first net that was drawn in is where focus comes for just a moment as we get ready to close. The first net is a good net to take note of in Acts chapter 2, that day of Pentecost. When a church that had nobody but 120 in an upper room threw out their first net and 3,000 come in, one-tenth of Jerusalem comes in. That's a good cast and a good draw. And when Peter was finished, the people said these words, what shall we do? Folks, I'm telling you, people have started to even ask me those questions. People in my apartment building, people that I've met, people that have, have known and, and have seen us and just going like, Hey, what, what do we do to get out of this? What do we do? And people are starting to ask, what do we need to do? Can I give you what our grid is? This is, this is what Peter's answer really becomes our answer. Listen to this. Peter says this. Here's how he answers it. Brethren, what shall we do? He says, Peter said to them, repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me look, look at that again. Repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, it's as simple as that. You know, what, you know what our grid is until Jesus comes? Be born again, be baptized in water, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let, let, let me just, let, listen, if you're looking for anything deeper, if you want me to be up here and give you the, de- here it is. This is as deep as I go. Be born again. Be baptized in water and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be born again. Be baptized in water and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you didn't understand. Let me help you. Be born again. Be baptized in water and be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want to know what Times Square Church is about, we want people to be born again. We want people to take a next step and be water baptized like the 136 that did it last week or three weeks ago. And we want people that we're going to be believing for be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want people changed that way. Now, folks, I, I was reading the story of the African diamond mines that were discovered in 1867. And this is what's amazing. It says, if you were to go to Africa now to look at the diamond mines, they are so far down into the earth. And they say when they excavate, they do find diamonds, but they're this small. They said back in 1867 when they discovered them, these were their words. They said, we found the biggest ones on the surface. That the further you go, you may find diamonds and they may be little, but the big ones are on the surface. You may look at me and go, Pastor Tim, you are so shallow, but the big diamonds are on the surface. (laughs) And here's the big diamonds. Be born again, be water baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. If that's what the Apostle Peter said, I'm not sure if you have better advice than that. Other than be born again, be baptized in water, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, when we pursue these three resolves, I'll leave the billion to God. I'm just going to pursue those three things. I'm not going after a number. I'm going after those three things. That's what I'm going after. And, And listen... I'll have people criticize this. I know as soon as you start sharing dream and vision, my mind goes back to Joseph, Genesis 37, 5. It says Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So I'm, I'm ready for anything. Let me just tell you this. I've had people criticize the born-again prayer. I've had people criticize, why do you do the ABCs every week? I love the story. I'm reading a book now on the life of D.L. Moody. 
who literally led more people to Christ as an American evangelist than anybody else in American history. And this is what one man said. One religious guy came to D.L. Moody and said, hey, I don't like the way you're doing born again. I don't like the way you're, you're telling people to be saved. So Moody said, tell me how you do it and I'll do it that way. The man said, I don't have a way. He goes, I like mine better. So this is what I've learned, folks. Everybody that criticizes haven't won people to Christ. So if you have a better way, tell me. I'll do it. And if you don't, then be born again, be water baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just give me a better way. Don't, don't give me all the techniques. Tell me a better way. I just want them born again. I want them water baptized, and I want them filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what I want to see God do. Some people are going to listen to this, and I, I, already, I already know it. Some are going to say, a billion? Seriously? What if it doesn't happen, Pastor Tim? What if you only get 1%? That's 10 million. I'll take it. So if you want to criticize and go, you missed it by 99%. We got 10 million up there anyway, so I'll take it anyway. There is no failure if you ask people to be born again, be water baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Carter made me a promise that if I died before him, he always talks to me about death. I said, can we talk about life just once? Pastor Carter said this, he says, I promise you, on your tombstone, it's just, he says, and I said, you have to promise me you're going to do it. He said, I promise. It was his idea. I'm going to put your name and only one other thing, ABC. I said, done. That's it. It's the only thing I want. Just put my name. I'm, I'm commissioning you now as a church to my tombstone. Just put my name and ABC. Let, if, if, I, I just learned a new phrase uh, um, from my wife and kids, if you know, then you know. <laughs> I'll let everybody else deal with it there. Just put my name in that. See, our goal is to create as many parties in heaven as possible with the angels. It's the second birthdays. But can I give you the TSC challenge today? I, I, there's, I, I was struggling whether to share this verse, but I feel like I have to. It's your hurdle. It's the hurdle of the past. Let me, let me just speak, because the hurdle wants to stay ground game when, when God is going, go Antioch, don't go Jerusalem, you got to go Antioch. It was the great persecution that went to Antioch. When bad times come, remember, God does new things. It's exactly what happened. The great persecution of the Old Testament was when Babylon came in and took the children of Israel into captivity. When they come back to Jerusalem, the temple changed. And here's what it says. Haggai prophesies and speaks to the people. and says, who's left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? He says, and how do you see it now? Doesn't that seem like nothing in comparison? That's what some people think. But he says, but take courage, Zerubbabel. Take courage, Joshua, high priest, and all you people of the land, take courage. And work, for I'm with you. And then he says this, as for the promise which I made you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst, so don't fear. He says, for thus says the Lord, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea. Get ready now, folks, get ready. Because some of you don't know where this comes from. Okay, before we go to the next verse, listen. He was a group of people going like, it's not like it used to be. It's not like the Jerusalem church. It's the, what, what, why are we all Antioch? Okay. Why, how come we're not running the ball? Because the forward pass is legalized. Okay, listen now. And then he says this to them. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I'll fill this house with glory. He goes, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, and then he says this. Here it comes. The latter glory of the house is going to be greater than the former glory. Thus says the Lord. He said, just because it may look different doesn't mean glory doesn't come. Just because it doesn't look like Jerusalem doesn't mean that souls aren't going to be saved in Antioch. 
I love what David Jeremiah said. He said, we are grateful for our memories, but our dreams should be greater than our memories. Our best work is still yet to come. Or can I give it to you this way? Our windshield has to be bigger than our rearview mirror. Oh, let me say that again. Send all the emails and letters you want. Our windshield has to be bigger than our rearview mirror. Ah, I'm all in, so, so it doesn't matter what you do. I'll, I'll have Elder Chris is here and Elder David. They're big men. They'll protect me. R.T. Kendall said it this way. He said to me, sometimes the greatest opposition of what God wants to do next comes from those who are on the cutting edge of what God did last. Ooh. Let me say that again. It's not the, I'm not worried about the government. See, one of the greatest works that God did and his God is still doing is in China today. And it was started by a man that had a dream to do something that it looked impossible. Today there are more Christians in China than any place around the world. And it's illegal to be a Christian in China. His name was Hudson Taylor. You need to get this down. This is what he said. He said, I've learned that there are three stages in the work of God. Impossible, difficult, done. Because we serve a great God. <laughs> Let me read that to you again. It's impossible. A billion souls, are you out of your mind? Yes. It's difficult. God goes, done. See, that's why when the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, what does it say? people perish. You guys know that. People perish. But here's the part that people misunderstand. Everybody preaches it like the church perishes. It's not that, folks. Listen. The people that don't know God perish. The lost go to hell if we don't have a vision. We have to have a vision. Why? Who's perishing? It's the people. I, they're lost in eternity. I, uh, can, can I take just about seven more minutes? Is that okay? This is really important. I, I'm going to do it anyway. I, I, I'm not, I can't remember. Someone, a pastor from Illinois sent this to me. He said, you preached this back in 2008. I, I remember the sermon. Is it a good idea or a God idea? And then I listed down these seven things. I'm gonna, I'll read them to you in a second. I call it seven indicators that something may be a God. I looked at it. I don't think it was mine. I, I must have stole it from somebody. But I didn't put a name there. But, I, but I'll, I'll read to you what I had. He sent, he said, Pastor Tim, you wrote, you sent this. You preached it and I wrote it all down. I'm not sure if it's mine. And if, and if somebody's listening who's going like, that's so-and-so, then you got me. I don't know. But here's what I realized, the difference between a good idea and a God. This is how you know something's a God idea. You ready? I'm going to give them to you fast, so get ready. If you're going to take notes, you better click. You better not write. You better click. Here it comes. The seven indicators. Go back to that because I want them to get the first slide in. Seven indicators that something may be a God idea versus a good idea. So get ready. You're going to have to click seven times. Here we go. Number one, everyone says it can't be done. Number two, you feel you aren't qualified. So far, I'm two for two. Number three, there aren't enough of resources available. Three for three. Number four, it makes no rational sense. Four for four. Number five, people call it or you stupid. Number six, it would give God all the glory when it takes place. And number seven, it will always honor God and be true to his word. That's the difference between a God idea and a good idea. This means a lot to me. Elder Jerry's here. Elder Chooks is here. Pastor Patrick and some of our board members are here. I shared this with our board not too long ago. And right after I was done, I, I want to read it to you. In fact, I'm going to put it on the screen. Our general overseer, Pastor Carter, sent me a text. And it means a lot to me. So he, he promised he'd put ABC on my tombstone. <laughs> And then he sent this to me. I want to read it to you. It was just that Sunday night after a board meeting. The Wright brothers were told they were foolish to think that they could cause men to fly. 
Most likely someone tried to discourage Edison from thinking he could make something that would light up the world. Evan Roberts was told he had lost his mind to think a revival was coming that would touch the world. And Pastor Carter said, I'm with the man who thinks we can get the message of Jesus to a billion people. That's all I want. I believe it. And if we only get 1%, that's 10 million. I'm in. So, so you may be sitting here going, then Pastor Tim, what do you want us to do? Here's the part. I've got to get this to you. I know I'm, I'm way over. I'm sorry, production. I'm sorry, everybody. I, I've got to do this because this, I'm only going to get to do this once. You're going to hear this once, and I'm going to get it. Everybody still here? I think I said seven minutes. I lied. So here we go. I need you to do these four things. And these are quick. Pray, connect, share, and ask. Those four things. I'll, I'll go through them quickly. One is we need you to pray. We need you to come to the prayer meeting. That means Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're all going to be here praying in person. Pastor Patrick talked. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I want you to pray and fast with us. I want you to get those prayer cards, those online. I want you to do this. Put your prayer cards. I'm asking people to put down the people they want to be saved this year. Put down the hardest people. Put down your supervisor. Put down your boss. Put down the person in the cubicle. Put down your neighbor in the apartment next to you that won't be quiet. Some of, I heard an amen over there. So I know who's going on his car. So let me just say this. Put people down. We need you to pray. We want you to come, come with us. How many are going to try their best to be with us for those next three nights in person? We're going to pray in person. It will not be online because we want you on Wednesday. Night. If you're going to be here in person, great. If you're going to go online, go to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. But I need you to pray. Why? Listen to it in the message. What a huge harvest. He said to his disciples, how few are the workers? On your knees and pray for harvest hands. That's what we're supposed to do. Number two, we want you to be connected to connect groups. We want you to be, there's so many connect groups coming from prison letters. R.T. Kendall is going to be doing a school of theology online. We're going to be doing so many different things. The content is going to be coming. But we don't want you just to join. We want you to lead and bring people. The 260 journey. And by God's grace, we're going to come out with a new uh, uh, Psalms and Proverbs. By God's grace, this year, by the fall, a journey through Psalms and Proverbs. And so we want to believe. But we need you connected to connect groups. Number three, always sharing with others. Share the message. Share with them to come. Come to Nikki Cruz. You know what we just found out? Freddie just told me this. He texted me last night. So we want you to come next week. We're going we're gonna to give you the, every venue for people to get born again. I don't know of a better evangelist than Nikki Cruz who has, led, who has led the two top people in your generation that have led most people to Christ, Billy Graham and Nikki Cruz. Why wouldn't you invite somebody here next week? Get them here or share it online. Just share it. Go to the air or do a ground game. We'll, we'll, we'll work them both. In fact, next week, Freddie said, he goes, we're also going to have, the choir is going to be back. We gave him this week off. The choir is going to be back with us next week. Choir singing and also joining us that day. If you've heard the song, um, uh, Your Grace is Enough, um, all that, Matt Marr is going to be joining us and helping us lead worship on that day. It's going to be happening on that. It's going to be an amazing day. And, and can I give you the fourth one that, man, I, I, it's important. Ask the big question. What is that, Pastor Tim? Ask people, have you been born again? I'm telling you, don't, have you, do you go to church? Are you a Christian? Ask them this, are you born again? I had a, I had a guy from Major League Baseball, go, why do you say born again? I said, because it's not me, it's Jesus' words. I said, that's why I say it. So I said, when you ask those fellow players, have they been born again, you're using Jesus' words. You're not using a Times Square church word, you're not using uh, a religious word, you're using a Jesus word. Ask the question. I've, a I've been asking people, and people are asking, what do we do then? Well, you got a first birth, and now you need a second birth. Let me give you ABCs. That's what you're learning. What shall we do? The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God isn't late with his promise as some measure lateness. He's restraining himself and holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone here and online space and time, hallelujah, to change. That's how great God is. So listen to me, balcony, main floor. Let me tell you how it works. I had a college student ask me last week, 
struggling with self-worth. And he asked me this question. He says, how, he asked, what do I do? Sounds like Acts 2.37, doesn't it? What do I do? I'm struggling with self-worth. And this is what I told him. I said, I'll tell you what you do. I said, I want you to understand this. Do you know how much you're worth to God? You're worth the price of the death of his son. Don't ever doubt if you're worth anything. God would send his son to die for you. I said, that's amazing. What do you do? That's how it starts. And some of you struggle with that. Would God ever love me? Would God ever care for me? Would God ever want me? Would God ever be part of my life? I'm here to tell you this. God loves you so much, he would send his own son to die for you. Why would you reject that? And here's what's amazing. Listen, here's what's amazing. God, who leads the entire universe, gives you the choice now to choose forgiveness in heaven. He said, I'm going to give you the fearful privilege of choosing if you want to be forgiven and eternity in heaven. You have the choice. And Jesus says the only way you get to heaven, the only way you could see the kingdom of heaven is you have to be born again. Not my words, Jesus' words. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? Just as you had a first birth, you need a second birth. How does that happen? It's as simple as ABC. It's A, admitting that I'm a sinner, that all of us are broken on the inside. We all, starting with me, have a condition. I've been diagnosed with a condition from my birth, and it's called sin. And there's no pastor or promise. There's no program or priest that can fix me. There's not a synagogue or a mosque that can, that can fix my inside. There's only one person that can fix it. And that comes from the B word, believe. Believe that God sent his son to die for my sinful condition. He became my sin bearer. He didn't die to get me to church. He died to get me to live with him forever in heaven. The goal wasn't simply church. The goal was heaven. The goal was eternity. And then see, confessing him as Lord, saying, you're in charge of my life. You're the boss now. The C, when you say confess, and you say you are Lord, you're saying you're in charge of my life. You're the boss now. That changes it from religion to relationship. Religion says, give me 90 minutes on a Sunday, unless Pastor Tim is speaking about vision, then it's going to last a little bit longer than 90 minutes. God goes, I, wasn't, I didn't come to get you 90 minutes once a week. I come to meet with you every single day and to have a relationship with you today. Everyone in this place, I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads as we get ready to leave here this afternoon. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and if you're watching online, it's the most important question I can ask is this, is have you been born again? It's the ABCs. It's admitting I'm a sinner. We're not mistakers in need of correction. We're sinners in need of a Savior. I don't need a second chance. I need a second birth. And today, you can have a second birth. How, Pastor Tim? I want to pray a born-again prayer. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born-again prayer, I want to be part of it. Would you include me in that prayer, Pastor Tim? Would you, when you pray it, would you put my name in there? And if you're online, if you're watching in this place, if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, Put me in that prayer today. I'm not going to make you stand. I'm not going to make you come forward. But I am going to ask you to do this. It's the most important decision you can make because it affects your today, tomorrow, and your forever. God brought you here today. But if you're sitting in this place today, I know our numbers are down, but that doesn't bother me. I'll take one. That just gets me one step closer to a billion. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, put me in there. I want to be part of that. With, without any hesitation, every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, put me in that prayer when you pray, and we'll all pray it together. If that's you, say, put me in that prayer, Pastor Tim. I want to start a journey with God today. Hold up your hand as high as you can. Hold it up as high as you can. I want to make sure I see every hand. Keep them up. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. I don't want to miss the balcony. Twenty-six, twenty-seven. That's fantastic. You can put your hands down. I'm blown away. The 27 people right here today. Hey, can we all pray this together? Come on, let's say this together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, 
and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together. Stand with me. You are such a kind church. And you musicians are so patient because you thought I was ending and I didn't. And so you just sat there and just let me do what we do. <laughs> so listen, how many would say it was good to be in God's house? Can I... If you, if you were one of those 27, if you're those online, nine people responded online. 36 folks have made a decision today to be born again. No, 11 people. They just changed it. So thank God, 38 people on this Sunday responded to be born again. How many would say this today? Just make me feel good. This is going to be totally selfish. Hey, we're with you, a billion people. We're going that way. We're going that way. That's what we're doing. All right, let me ask you this. How many are going like, we want people to be born again? We want people to be water baptized. We want people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. All right. So this week, we need you to pray and fast. That means, oh, I'm, you're supposed to text the side of the 51,000 for your next steps. You'll see that on the screen. You do that. 38 people, you do that. Hey, this week, we, oh no, now they keep updating it. 16 people responded online. Hallelujah. That means 42 born again today so far. 42. <laughs> 